Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome friends again to the um, lecture series on introduction to science fiction studies. I'm sure you have had much fun learning about time travel in the previous lecture. There we discussed a lot of concepts, lot of paradoxes, lot of anomalies about time and how the element of time um, portrays itself, how human beings portray and play with the idea of time in science fiction that we have discussed in the previous lecture. So in this lecture what we are going to do is we are going to talk about space. The two most important things for human being or the reality of human being is time and space. Just because we had the lecture about time we are safe to talk about time and space together in this lecture. So the two things that are most important to us is time and space and when I say this sentence I mean it. For example, you ask your friend, tomorrow will you meet me? So the friend will say, okay, where and when? Any time when you ask, you make an appointment, these two things are very important, where and when. We cannot say, I'm going to meet you tomorrow at the juice corner. You will say, okay, at what time? The other person is of course bound to request for the time component. That is, this exactly means that we are fixed in the dimension of time and space. So if I am here at this particular stage right now, in front of you, in front of the camera, there is a particular time. If you are watching this, you are probably watching a recording and whatever has happened in front of you, whatever is happening has already happened before. That is this lecture, this lecture that I am recording, this has already been recorded and you are only watching what has already taken place in the past. And in, of course, in some other place, you are watching it in front of you. But this has taken place in some studio somewhere and you have just the recording of that. So in order to find me in this particular period, in order to find uh, whoever the person is delivering the lecture, you will have to know two things. Where was I and what was the time? I am currently at uh, Kanpur and the time is 2.10. Uh, PM. So if you as a scientist travel back in time from the time you are right now and not traveling back in time will not suffice, that will not be enough. You will have to be in Kanpur in order to find me. So suppose that is a possibility, you are traveling back in time, you will have to know the place also. So space is as important as time that those are the two things that we have right so another concept that i will discuss is that we live in a 3d kind of setting right we are three dimensional beings we whatever the matter we interact with those are all in stride three dimension okay one is length one is breadth and one is height so in these three dimensions we understand everything the fourth dimension however is time dimension. So in order to give the coordinates of a person, you will have to give the coordinates of that person in 3D and the fourth dimension here is time. So we will discuss about the space mostly but without discussing the time, we cannot discuss the space really. So first let us consider the concept of space. What is space? Three dimensional continuum. The word continuum means something that continues forever, right? 
So if I have uh, let's say a sheet of paper with me right now, if I have a sheet of paper and I have this, it will continue in all the places, continuum, in continuity. It is not only just here, it will be everywhere. So space is that idea, length, width and height, providing a coordinate system to describe the positions of objects in the universe. So when there is a particular area, this is a particular area, right? I'm standing in front of you because it is a three dimensional area. Therefore, you can see the length, you can see the height, you can also see the breadth of this thing. This particular object, this has a height, right? If you want to calculate the length, you will have to use, uh, let's say, if you put it like this, then the length will be this one, the height will be this particular, um, this segment and the breadth will be this segment. So it, it just because it is spherical, you are considering it uh, as a, uh, it is a cylindrical object. So the idea will be different. So what I'm trying to say is that had it been a two dimensional space, if it, it is a three dimensional space, that is why you're seeing it like this. Had it been a two dimensional space, you would have seen this as a straight line, no height. There will be no height component. You will not see a cylindrical object. You will just see a straight line with a length and a breadth. Right? So that is um, the concept of dimension. Cosmic scale. These are the concepts which are very much attached to space. Vast and incomprehensibly large. Comprehension means to understand. So the cosmic scale in which the space that we consider space is um, um, uh, distributed in a cosmic scale. That is, we cannot imagine what is the farthest point in space. We can say, yes, uh, this particular India has this is the border and after that you cross, it will be Nepal, China, Bhutan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. You know the boundary of India, you know the geographical boundary, you know the political boundary, everything you know. But what is the boundary of space? Do you know that? So we cannot even comprehend, we cannot even understand, we cannot even imagine what that boundary will be. So it is vast and incomprehensible. It is like identifying where is the sky, where does the sky end? Is there an ending to the sky? No, for us there is no ending to the sky because that is our perception. The distances between celestial bodies are measured in light years. So in the cosmic scale, when you are trying to uh, gauge, when you are trying to measure the distance between two celestial bodies, that is two heavenly bodies or two bodies in space, then you try to understand it by a distance. But what happens when you cannot understand the distance because the distance is so big that if you try to write the distance in the terms of kilometers, you will finish a paper. It is useless that way to write a distance like that. So what we do instead, we count the space, the distance between two heavenly bodies with the unit of light years. Light years. Light years is the distance light travels in a year. We know the speed of light. We know how much light will take to travel from sun to earth. It takes roughly 8 minutes. From sun to earth, it takes roughly 8 minutes. So, so long a distance. It still take 8 minutes for um, the light to reach this planet. Same light if it travels for a year in space. So that is the distance that light covers in a year. That is the light year. With the closest star to the sun, Proxima Centauri. So the closest sun that we have, the closest solar system that we have, the closest sun to our sun is Proxima Centauri and we cannot even um, start to comprehend the distance for um, writing the distance in kilometers. We prefer light years. Located over four light years away. 
four light years away that means the distance light will cover in four years that is how far the next solar system the next sun the next star the nearest star is there to our sun celestial bodies stars are there planets are there moons are there asteroids are there comets are there these all celestial bodies that we know of these are the very popular ones what about those which are not so popular that means which we do not know we do not know because we are not a part of astrophysics we have not gone into higher astrophysics uh, or higher education regarding astrophysics so are they not a part of the uh, space concept of course they are they are even available in science fiction novels and works of literature that is how science communication brings difficult very um, nerve shattering concepts you know very surprising concepts to daily human knowledge system we will talk about that later expanding universe there is a concept called the big bang the big bang theory that is uh, the entire universe generated from uh, a single explosion what happens when something explodes everything goes from here to there and there are a lot of sound lot of light lot of energy released and whatever has exploded the pieces are flying here and there exactly that is what happened that is what the science scientists conjecture the scientists speculate that this is why uh, the universe is expanding gradually it the the sun the star that was nearest to us now is a little bit far from when it was thousands of years ago that is how we know that the universe is expanding one of the most significant discoveries in modern astrophysics is that the universe is expanding so it is expanding in space galaxies are moving away from each other suggesting that the universe started from a singular point in the past that is the big bang there was a small point in uh, the time space continuum which was so heavy which was so um, uh, the gravity the force of gravity was so much that it exploded completely so a vacuum this is another concept a near perfect vacuum meaning it contains space is a near perfect vacuum do you have the idea of vacuum where there is no pressure there is no um, heat there is uh, no concept of of course it is very cold because there is no temperature there is no dust there is no particle everything the entire thing is empty right so space is a near perfect vacuum because it contains very few particles and atoms per cubic meter it is so big that 1 cubic meter of space has almost zero particles this low density allows light and other electromagnetic radiation to travel through space virtually unimpeded when there is particle when there is air when there is um, anything inside space then it crosses friction due to friction what happens is that whatever is moving the speed is impeded the speed becomes slow but because space is a near vacuum therefore the light waves they travel without any kind of obstacle or impediment the electromagnetic waves can travel without any obstacle or impediment so a light from a star can reach our earth without any kind of intervention without having to suffer um energy loss the light will somewhere get absorbed nothing of that happens that is why we at the night see a sky full of stars now we are moving on to a more interesting concept of black holes we have discussed black holes when we were talking about um time travel we took a sheet of paper then we said that gravity folds space like that and therefore it reduces the time for which we take in order to come from one point to another point we discussed all of those things regions in space where gravity is so intense that nothing not even light can escape the gravitational pull they are formed from the remnants of massive stars after supernova explosions supernova explosions happen 
when instead of nuclear fission reaction there is a nuclear fusion reaction uh, a very interesting concept fission is when uh, a bigger atom breaks down into a smaller atom fusion is when smaller atoms uh, are forced to form a bigger atom so these things uh, you if you are interested in you can go and check mostly supernova explosion means when a star bursts suppose the sun which is the um, center of our solar system we pray to the sun god we think of sun as a god so many things around the sun the entire planet is indebted to sun for the sub sustenance of life for the growth of life all the trees and plants are there because of the sun the temperature is there uh, optimal for us the uh, living beings they depend on the sunlight everything happens because of the sun rays what will happen if the sun suddenly bursts everything will be destroyed so supernova explosion is uh, that kind of thing when uh, something becomes very you know the gravitational pull suddenly increases in a particular object why will it increase because um, well uh, if you want a, a small short of definition uh, when the sun or any burning body stops burning what happens is that the heat goes away and it starts to cool down it starts to cool down but there is no lower temperature because it is in space you can cool down as much as you want so when anything cools down it becomes smaller and uh, the atoms and uh, molecules they come closer and everything happens so it starts cooling down and we know that there is a pull there is a gravitational force there is a attracting force within the atomic structure so now everything is cooling down and becoming smaller so the sun which was very big has now become a small thing a small point of matter then also it is again it is further cooling down because there is no um, you know uh, heat is constantly escaping so now what happens is that one small point can weigh weigh means it is the weight of that one small point can be you know millions of tons so the gravitational pull within that small point is so much so that now the atomic structure becomes to wiggle it becomes unstable so now the atoms are pushing against each other now smaller atoms are trying to push inside and get inside the other atoms because the space has become very small there is no space you know with between two atoms over there what happens then a fusion reaction takes place when two atoms are forced to uh, sort of um, merge into each other it becomes a fusion reaction and it emits uh, you know a nuclear kind of energy only two atoms can do that suppose an entire planet full of atoms they do that same thing and there is a fusion reaction and the entire thing bursts when the entire thing bursts all the energy that is released along with that all the atoms are now pulling the entire thing the atoms have the gravitational force remember so they are now pulling everything towards it it is not a uh, like an explosion it is more of an implosion it is bursting within it is bursting inside so whatever is outside is getting inside pulled inside so it is so much so that time is being pulled inside and space is being pulled inside when that happens a black hole is formed right so this is the concept earlier uh, people said uh, stephen hawking came up with that uh, idea of black hole and he said that um, we cannot see a black hole because if light goes it will never come back because it will get sucked into it but i will talk to you about the uh, other things that uh, is happening so this is the idea of a black hole and if the space is uh, being you know pulled into it so it becomes spherical right so you can use it 
if you can sustain the gravity if your machine can sustain that kind of gravitational pull it can go from one place to another place within a blink of an eye so moving on to the other thing dark matter and dark energy not directly observable scientists believe that a significant portion of the universe is composed of dark matter dark matter because we cannot see it that is why it's called dark matter it absorbs light so it is invisible to us and dark energy energy that energy is also not visible to us because that is some kind of energy which is undetectable both of which play essential roles in the dynamics of the cosmos antimatter a form of matter composed of antiparticles properties opposite to matter this is matter this is antimatter you cannot see it because it is antimatter so if we bring those two things in contact with each other they will destroy each other and you will have nothing so everything gets destroyed if antimatter matter and matter comes into contact with each other this is also a concept very popular in space travels space narratives not directly observable scientists believe that a significant portion of the universe is composed of dark matter and dark energy both of which play essential roles in the dynamics of the cosmos a form of matter composed of antiparticles properties opposite to matter when antimatter comes into contact with regular matter they annihilate each other converting their mass into energy in the form of gamma rays so when this matter and uh, when the antimatter and this particular matter they will con come in contact with each other they will annihilate each other they will destroy each other the matter will destroy the antimatter and the antimatter will destroy the matter so together there will be only some emission of gamma rays right next is space exploration humans have been driven to explore space leading to the development of space missions telescopes and probes that have allowed us to study distant planets moons and other celestial objects starting with the sputnik with the apollo missions you just go and uh, google space travel and human beings or uh, the history of space travel of human beings you will find a lot of literature related to that an entire wikipedia section with all the references related to that so there you will find that sputnik apollo missions these were the missions the earliest missions uh, which were sent to moon to outer space uh, to mars all of these things had happened in a gradual kind of way so human beings human beings fascination for space had been you know a long time story then philosophical and existential reflections space has inspired philosophical and existential contemplations about humanity's place in the universe the possibility of extraterrestrial life and the nature of time and reality so once you are in the outer space now you are looking at earth from a different perspective you no longer belong to that planet so once you are out of that planet you are out of the situation you are out of the people you are out of the context you start thinking what it is to be alive on the planet because you are not on mars you are not on venus there are not uh, there are no other planets in this solar system which can sustain life so what is the meaning of life you become philosophical you start to question the existence of life on this planet so those are the philosophical and existential reflections concepts in space uh, travel science fiction so right after a discussion of space and celestial bodies we will be discussing more on them now we will discuss what are the popular things popular ideas uh, which we have already looked at before in um, the area of science fiction interplanetary travel interplanetary travel means traveling from say earth to mars to Ju from earth to jupiter earth to saturn earth to all the planets in the solar system and beyond right so going beyond is what is interstellar travel let me tell you stella this means star 
star is what our sun is our sun is a star so when we are discussing interstellar travel that means we are discussing traveling from our solar system to another solar system when we go to another solar system it will have its own planetary system right so interstellar travel is you know bigger travel than interplanetary travel now warp drives is a very famous concept which is used in science fiction so when we discuss warp drives it is traveling via a superluminal spacecraft propulsion system superluminal don't be afraid of this word superluminal is similar to supersonic i'm sure supersonic is much more common a word supersonic is faster than sound there are supersonic jets in our reality we have i think it is mark 23 or something like that there is a jet uh, designed by our human beings uh, the human civilization human technological advancement has been so uh, booming in the past uh, a couple of decades we have jets flying faster than sound that is first you will see the jet cross the sky then after a few seconds you will hear the sound so it's very interesting that is supersonic now exactly you apply that thing to light superluminal that is which is faster than light first you will uh, you know the thing has gone by a long time before but the light is coming later so by the time you see that um, thing that thing has already gone by that jet has already crossed it okay so superluminal faster than light when you go faster than light you have a sense of time travel that means uh when light our entire reality is built on what we see right we are seeing uh, right now you are seeing me in front of you because this lights all over there they are reflecting on me on my glasses uh, you can see those reflections also but every time the light is reflecting back to the camera lens that is capturing this video right now suppose i am faster than light so by the time you are seeing this lecture this this present is gone this has already become a past so this entire situation is a kind of situation which will give you a feel of time travel because right now you are looking at this uh, video you are thinking that this is what is happening now but no this has happened before this is just a recording that you are watching right so you are traveling back to the past through this record and seeing me right now recording this lecture you are time traveling remember now rubber science it's a very popular concept that we have uh, it is actually uh, in order it is a little bit term which is used to um, talk about science which is not science how is that possible science which is not science so it is pseudo science pseudo science means uh, i'm trying to explain a scientific technology a scientific process but it is not all true it is not all factual right rubber science is a term in science fiction that refers to a pseudo scientific explanation crafted for a particular element of the story setting we will of course uh, talk about some of these pseudo science scenarios after you know in the uh, next part of the lecture so rubber science is that kind of explanation which is given to the viewer so this is happening because of the portal opening in the sky or this is happening because the person injected himself with this kind of medicine that is not true right because we don't have that technology but we are trying to give it a very good uh, explanation right but skillfully constructed to maintain a sense of believability so uh, the scientific explanation that i'm giving to you is believable right well, i'm sure you are familiar with the movie spiderman where a mutant spider comes and bites another person the person becomes a um, mutant himself and shoots wave through his wrists and hangs from the ceiling and flies through using webs all those things happen because there is a change in his dna 
DNA modification, DNA engineering is not that easy. You really need very advanced technologies like I will tell you CRISPR, CRISPR Cas9 technology. This is the name of the technology for genetic engineering where enzymes are put into the body which goes and uh, sort of scissors uh, and uh, modifies the DNA present inside the body. So that is a completely different technology. A spider bite cannot do that. So it can be considered a rubber science. It's an explanation that is given, but it is not entirely true as well. EHT project. This is very fascinating. I am sure you will certainly go and look at the EHT project website. Every person on this planet must know about EHT project. It is Event Horizon Telescope Project. Event Horizon. Because we discussed black hole a few, um, a couple of maybe 10 minutes ago. Event Horizon is how you see a black hole. That means uh, if there is nothing, if light is not reflecting from anything, how are we able to see it? It is not possible. No, you cannot see it, but you can see the light which is bending beside it. All the light are, uh, you know, whatever light is going inside, of course, it is not going to come back. But the light which is traveling from very far, that light is bending due to the gravitational field of the black hole. So once it is, it starts bending, uh, due to the gravitational field of the black hole, you will see that there is a, a, the, a donut shape. It's called a donut shape structure. So uh, you will see something like this. There is a, a, a plane like this. The entire plane where the space is actually folding around this particular point. This point you will not be able to see because this will be completely dark you will only be seeing the light which is surrounding it. So that has been very recently, only one year or two years back, been captured by Event Horizon Telescope, which is a project of NASA. Go to Event Horizon NHT website. That is the website. What they did was they created a telescope the size of the earth. Now how can they create a telescope the size of the earth? We have never seen such news. No, they did not create a lens telescope. They created a kind of, uh, if this is, suppose this is the planet earth and this is the black hole over here, right? You cannot see the black hole because light does not come out of it. So there is no point in doing that. What the scientists did is that they connected many uh, satellite uh, cameras around this planet. All the telescopes which capture radiation. You cannot see light but you can capture electromagnetic radiation. So all the uh, telescopes that are set throughout earth every all the telescopes were connected together with a single operating system single computer so all the images they were receiving they were analyzing the images uh, comparing the images together all the data was compiled together and then the data was analyzed in order to generate one single image see the kind of beauty the science has with us and thereby they saw exactly what they expected to see the event horizon of a black hole which is very you know very far from earth by the way so to capture the images of two supermassive black holes remember not one they have captured images of two black holes with the largest apparent event horizons SG, uh, actually this is pronounced as Sagi A star, it is Sagittarius A star at the center of the Milky Way. Milky Way is the name of our galaxy. Uh, the solar system is part of our galaxy. There are many galaxies in the sky. 
So SGR A star, SAGI A star at the center of Milky Way and M87, this is the another name of the another black hole in the center of Virgo A galaxy. So these are the two black holes that uh, science has talked about but black holes have been in science and popular culture long way back. Okay, Nebula. Nebula is a character in Guardian of the Galaxies movie. I remember, uh, if you remember, it will be very nice. Nebula is a very beautiful concept which is used in many science fiction movies and literature. It is a star forming region. I will uh, give you the name, just Google Pillars of Creation. Pillars of Creation is a nebula. A, a nebula happens when a supernova, uh, supernova uh, explosion, um, it can happen from any other cosmic phenomena. So, pillars of creation is a kind of structure in space from where galaxies are born. Can you imagine galaxies are born even today when we are speaking and having this uh, conversation here. So, it is a part of the Eagle Nebula. Go to Google, search for Nebula, you will be fascinated with the pictures they give you. Then we have celestial bodies in science fiction moon, a popular destination in science fiction stories, often serving as a base for lunar colonies or as a location for mysterious events. So the earliest science fiction that we talked about was traveling to moon. If you are familiar with the character of Tintin, uh, which is written by a, um, you know, created, it's a comics, a very popular comics. So, Tintin goes to moon, right? So, that is an interesting story. You can just look up. Mars, often portrayed as the next front human exploration, frequently in science fiction as a place that has been terraformed, colonized or visited by astronauts. The famous movie Martian, if you want to see, you can have a look at it. It is very accurate. Next, we have alien planets, planets with exotic landscape, landscapes we have not seen before, where the hills are in a different flora and fauna, where the terrain is different, everything is unearth like unique ecosystems. There are organisms over there which we have never seen before, right? And civilization vastly different from Earth's. Instead of living in homes, they live in colonies. Instead of um, following a government system, they have a different kind of system. If it is a machine civilization, then they will have a different system. That is what the movie Transformers is about. If you want to have an idea about science fiction and robots and um, organism and machine, uh, organisms, you can just go and look up the story or the background story of the movie Transformers. Saturn and its moons, impressive rings and diverse moons such as Titan and Enceladus have served as setting for various science fiction tales. Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter and its massive storms and moons like Europa have inspired intriguing space exploration stories. So Jupiter is famous for its storms, let me tell you. And also the gravitational pull of Jupiter, if you, you know, walk it like you are bouncing in a moon, that is okay because moon has very less gravity. Once you go to Jupiter, you will not be able to stand up. You will be crawling like insects and cockroaches. So that kind of story is completely different again. Artificial celestial bodies. Space stations, space habitats, and ring worlds, which serve as key elements in the story system and plot. Exoplanets, an array of fictional worlds with diverse characteristics and environments outside our solar system. Any planet outside our solar system is exoplanet. Dyson spheres and mega structures. These hypothetical structures. These hypothetical structures designed to harness the energy of a star have been a recurring concept in science fiction stories set in advanced civilizations. We Can you imagine harnessing the energy of a star? 
harnessing is utilizing the energy of a star and using the energy to let's say generate electricity let's say generate physical power mechanical power chemical power by drawing the energy of a star so that is dyson sphere we have already discussed black holes before that now we are going to discuss another fascinating concept of wormholes funnel shaped portal that connects two points in time or space it is also called as einstein rosen bridges black holes we have understood they are um, so they are a place where gravity pulls everything now wormholes are structures like this these are like wormholes so this particular bridge from this reality this is the space around it and this particular place is the hole through which one person can go from one space to another wormholes are completely different from black holes black holes but they do mostly the same uh, have the same kind of function in black holes you can go from one place to another in a blink of an eye using a wormhole you can do the same but it is a funnel shaped kind of thing so it is called an einstein rosen bridge it is a kind of thing uh, which we can say uh, it bends the space time fabric fabric is when you have a piece of cloth and you put a weight on the piece of cloth don't you think that the cloth sinks a little bit right the cloth sinks a little bit suppose space and time is like that cloth and because of the force because of the pull the cloth is sinking like this the space and time is sinking like this right and from another part it is sinking from another part it is also um, sinking so when the two sinks contra uh, you know meet each other they form a funnel from both the sides right so the both time and space from this side also time and space is sinking from that side also time and space is sinking and they connect in the middle so that is uh, the einstein rosen bridge very interesting concept okay nebula and galactic objects we have already discussed about them before star clusters and other galactic phenomena frequently appear in science fiction adding visual splendor and mystery to the backdrop of the story asteroid comets we have discussed smaller celestial bodies commonly used as locations for space mining operations hidden bases or as objects threatening earth in impact scenarios now we will discuss some literary works which have taken all of these into consideration the most famous one is 2001 a space odyssey by arthur c clark a novel co-written with stanley kubrick's film an ancient alien monolith that prompts humanity's journey to the stars and the birth of artificial intelligence this is the backdrop of the story dune by frank herbert set on the deepest planet arrakis features space travel as part of the broader interstellar political and economic landscape in the fictional universe of the book so dune is also a very popular uh, fiction when it comes to space travel the left hand of darkness by ursula k le guin remember left hand of darkness is very much popular with us we have discussed also about it set in hainish cycle an envoy's mission to a distant planet where the inhabitants can change their gender exploring themes of humanity diplomacy and alienness ender's game by orson scott card young ender wigan a brilliant child trained to lead earth's military forces in a war against an alien species known as the formix So this is again another story of alien invasion and space travel. Gateway by Frederick Pohl. Let me tell you, Gateway is by far, um, you know, right after Dune, you can place Gateway, an alien space station filled with mysterious starships, leading to a mix of adventure, risk, and psychological exploration. Hyperion by Dan Simmons, the first book in Hyperion Cantos series. Seven pilgrims on a journey through space 
each telling their stories as they travel to meet the enigmatic shrike. So it is very, you can compare this kind of journey to the Canterbury Tales written by Geoffrey Chaucer. Uh, there also people go to the shrine of um, Thomas Beckett to pay their homage and while going they tell stories to each other. Right? Red Mars by Kim Stanley Robinson, the first book in the Mars trilogy, colonization. Uh, these are the themes, colonization, terraforming. Terraforming is when you um, use engineering knowledge and technology to change the atmosphere of a planet, to change the uh, structure of a planet, components of a planet, what kind of soil it has, what kind of uh, flora and fauna it has. You are going to change everything that is called terraforming. Of Mars by a group of scientists and settlers exploring the political, environmental and scientific aspects of space travel. The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers follows the diverse crew of a wormhole building spaceship. So this spaceship can build wormholes, highlighting their interactions and challenges during long space journeys. The Expanse series by James S. A. Corey, starting with Leviathan Wakes. It is a, again the name of a series set in a future where humanity has colonized the solar system uncover a vast conspiracy with the potential to change the course of human history. Neuromancer, I have taken the name of Neuromancer multiple times by William Gibson, a cyberpunk novel. Remember, cyberpunk means that there will be a hacker, there will be computer system, there will be artificial intelligences, a person who is hacking into the computer system, retrieving data, all of these things are part of the cyberpunk culture. It includes elements of space travel, and features a heist in space to steal data from an orbiting space station. Now we are going to discuss a little bit about the trends that have been there in science fiction or science travel, uh, space travel narratives. Earlier initially, this is the initial phase, the destination mattered and neither the technology nor the journey. Nobody talked about the journey in the earliest of science fiction only you have reached moon now the moon looks like this there are aliens on the planet but nobody is going to talk about how did you reach moon right what is the science behind that no explanation you have just reached there then what happened estrangement questioning earthly values philosophical flux so every time you leave the planet earth and you go to moon and you look at the planet, what is the meaning of the uh, life on earth? What does it mean? We kill, we rob each other, we are full of greed, we are there to cut each other's throat just for money or for fun. Isn't it a very childlike because now we are out of the context of earth. Then what happened is other worlds which offer sites for metaphysical and cultural speculation. When you go to another world, it is like visiting another country. They have their religion, they have their culture, they have their politics. You cannot uh, counter them, you cannot question them. So you become more accepting when you go to a different planet. But do you do the same when you are on this planet? So it is a kind of comparison, a metaphysical conceit. Jules Verne first talks about the technology from the earth to the moon and its sequel round the moon in 1873. So the first time people talked about how a spaceship left earth and went to moon, Jules Verne was the one who talked about it. He said there is a space cannon and the people were fit inside that cannon and the cannon was fired and everybody went to moon. It's still an idea, right? Space Opera, Star Wars, Empire, Colonization. So gradually the entire space, the galaxy, the other universe, people started to bring all of them also into the science fiction narratives. The phrase space opera was coined in 1941 to label hack science fiction and it kept its negative meaning until the 1980s. 
when it was redefined to mean science fiction adventure narratives. So earlier when somebody says, oh, it's a space opera, it meant in a negative sense that anything and everything could happen. But later on in the 1980s, uh, uh, the fans, they tried to redefine what space opera is. Now, the last part we'll come to is accuracy. Accuracy in space travel narratives. Earlier, it was all rubber signs. We discussed rubber science a few minutes back, right? But nowadays, we have the technology, we have the resource to accurately depict what is going to happen in space. I have taken the example of two very popular movies. There is also a third movie, Gravity. You can watch it and discuss accuracy. Okay, so in 2014, Interstellar was released. It was directed by Christopher Nolan. The script was written by Jonathan Nolan and Kip Thorne. Who is Kip Thorne? See, American theoretical physicist and Nobel laureate. So Kip Thorne is not some uh, guy with a uh, physics degree. Kip Thorne is a Nobel laureate and he helped write the screenplay of Interstellar. That is how precise the screenplay of Interstellar was. Kip Thorne later on, after the movie was released, Kip Thorne published the book The Science of Interstellar in 2014. What happens in Interstellar roughly is traveling through a black hole called Gargantua in search of alternative alternative planets with potential to sustain human life. So in this story, human civilization on earth is on the verge of extinction. There is blight, there is no reproduction of crops, sorry, there is no production of crops, uh, only wheat is available. Everybody is relying on that. So people are trying to find a second planet which has less pollution, which has less weather constraints and where human life can prosper. So, alternative planets with potential to sustain human life. The entire thing is, uh, the entire production is very much um, good with accuracy. Then, it has visual accuracy. When the, when the, uh, actually the spaceship is moving from one place to another and is also going into the event horizon area of the black hole, the visuals that this movie gives is very much accurate and the telescope that EHT, the, the Event Horizon Telescope, what the image of the black hole they gives is very similar. The Martian, which is, you know, uh, released in 2011, uh, an older movie rather, it was first a novel, uh, published as a novel by Andy Weir. He started to write Martian as a blog. He just was writing a blog, a story in his blog. But later on, it became so popular and the science was so accurate that the, um, the company which produced Martian, they bought the copyright and produced a movie. It was about surviving on Mars and getting extracted. So the scientist, he somehow gets caught in Mars and the ship that is going back home, it leaves uh, Mars, it is on its way home. The moment he realizes that he is left alone on Mars, he starts strategizing how to uh, live on the planet and how to survive on it, relying on the space hub they had over there, right? So, in order to write that actually, Andy Weir had to research into orbital mechanics, conditions on the planet Mars, the history of human spaceflight and botany. So, all of these things taken together, uh, this entire movie and the story was very accurate from the uh, science part of um, discussion. Now, let us have a quiz time so that we can analyze what are the things that we have discussed so far or have we been able to get something from all the discussion that we had. How does the concept of space travel in science fiction differ from real world theories and possibilities? For that, you can search for this man, Neil deGrasse Tyson. 
just search for his uh, podcast you will find wonderful contents available on this particular subject name some science fiction authors who explored the space travel theme what are the famous space travel strategies used by the authors whom you have read about so far out of the multiple space travel concepts discussed in this lecture which one interests you the most and why space travel and time travel are very closely related can you discuss any work of fiction it be it movies novel other forms of literature which explores both the theme how does the plot try to rationalize the blend discuss the trend of using space travel in science fiction so once you are able to answer all these questions you will know that you have a very good idea you have now a form based on time and space narratives in the field of science fiction so now in order to answer the questions if you have any place that you want to look for or discuss here are a few very solid references you can just go and click one is thorn kip kip thorn the nobel laureate the science of interstellar then of course the science fiction a very short introduction i tell about this book it's a very thin book you can give it a read and you will have a very basic knowledge of science fiction studies Darkus UV Metamorphosis of Science Fiction on the Poetics and History of a Literary Genre there is a special section for space travel narratives you can confirm with those things as well then you have Stephen Hawking i am asking you to read Stephen Hawking or about the theories of Stephen Hawking because he was the one to come up with the idea of the black holes to begin with and he also said that black holes can be determined or detected via Hawking radiation that was his concept then you can read about the wormholes and warp drives and other technologies that can uh, be the future of human being human civilization and then the viewer novel um, the martian you can t uh, there is a actually discussion forum about this novel about the science of this novel so it will be a very uh, good food for thought for um, young learners of science fiction thank you very much i hope you like this lecture be back for more see you in the upcoming series Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. 
they are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.